Hey, everybody, it's Jay Bear from Convince and Convert Joined, as always, by my special Texas friend. He is from Austin. He is the executive strategist for Salesforce Marketing Cloud. It is Mr. Adam Brown. Hello, my friend. Hello. How are you, Jay? I am spectacular, and this was such a great episode. We were uh, joined, as you just heard, by Andy Cernovitz, who's uh, the CEO and founder of socialmedia.org. And I love what he said in that little clip uh, about authenticity. And, and look, fundamentally, everybody in social media has the same challenge, which is how do you use social to get people to pay attention to you? And yeah, to some degree, it's a creative exercise, but I loved what Andy talked about in this episode about having a deeper meaning, about, about having a rationale, the theory of the firm, Tom Webster would call it. Uh, and boy, this, this was really a, a, an episode worth uh, spending some time with. It is. And I really appreciate Andy's perspective on all this. I've known Andy for nearly a decade and a half, Jay. I know you've known him for almost uh, that long as well. Andy, from where he sits with the, uh, with, with the blog council, uh, which became socialmedia.org, really sits in an interesting position. And what he talked about here and what he talks about further in the podcast around authenticity and Jay, around kind of that double meaning of the word social, of social as we typically talk about being social media, but social as it relates to activism, as it relates to community, as it relates to philanthropy and all those other things that have to take, that a brand has to use to, to propel themselves further here in 2019. If you want an episode about how to caption your Instagram photo, this is not the episode for you. If you want an episode for why we're all here and what is the meaning of social media and what is the point of this work, this is the episode for you. Andy Cernovitz from socialmedia.org. Before we jump into it, I wanted to thank Andy and his team at socialmedia.org for being sponsors of the Social Pros podcast. As you'll hear us talk about a little bit during the episode, the socialmedia.org community is extraordinary. Adam's been a member uh, in two different times. I've actually spoken there as well, one of the few people from the outside who've been allowed to address the group. And the way it works is that it is a collection of people who manage social media at some of the biggest brands in the world. And it gives them an opportunity to interact, to answer common questions, to share knowledge, to, to, uh, to really build a community. So many of you listening meet this test. You run social media at some of the biggest brands in the world. That's why this show exists. Uh, if you're not part of socialmedia.org, you should really uh, think about that. Adam, you, you've been there. What do you think? It's a great organization. And as Andy speaks uh, to here in this podcast, the organization has evolved. It is certainly about those tactical and technical training. When something goes wrong on Facebook or the Facebook algorithm changes, you have a network of people that you can talk to immediately. As, as Andy talks about when, as you know, the CMO is, is walking down to, uh, to come to your office for an answer about something. <laughs> yeah. But there's a very, go ahead. Oh, okay. No, and it, but there's, there's that and then there's this other kind of more professional level of training. As we all matriculate and move up in our respective organizations, there's a need for us to have kind of professional executive management training and peering. And that, again, is one of the great aspects of this community that, that Andy and his team has created. They don't let just everybody in. Uh, it's nope. very curated, as we talked about in the episode, but go to socialmedia.org slash socialpros, socialmedia.org slash socialpros to apply. And we've already had many Social Pros listeners uh, take advantage of that and apply for membership. So thank you to, uh, for doing that. So give that a shot. Also, uh, before we get into the show, I want to thank uh, Adam and his team at Salesforce for putting together the new State of Marketing Report. It is unbelievable. They interviewed 4,100 marketing leaders from around the world, which is an unbelievable research accomplishment in and of itself. And this thing is full of data that you need to make sure that you are on track in 2019 and beyond. It talks about the impact of customer experience on marketing, talks about the role of social, how that's changing, talks about uh, the impact of uh, AI and machine learning in 2019. It is a barn burner. I want you to download it. And so you will remember the URL to download. I've created a very special bit.ly. It's bit.ly slash J says bit.ly slash J says, J-A-Y-S-A-Y-S. Go do that as soon as the show is over and get yourself a copy of the Salesforce State of Marketing Report. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear from our friend, Andy Cernovitz. Andy. 
Andy Cernovitz, CEO of Board.org and socialmedia.org, author of the seminal book, Word of Mouth Marketing, my friend, and a benefactor of the show now, welcome to the Social Pros Podcast. Very excited to be here after all these years. I know this it's ridiculous good. that we haven't had you uh, on the show. We just waited for you to, you know, to 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 be sort of a, a an eminent screech or whatever, and then we'll, then we'll bring you on onto the show. Uh, tell every now we've been talking. Ed and I've been talking. Probably gray. I just I know what eminence grief means. I know you do. I know you. Do. Uh, <laughs> Adam and I have been talking about socialmedia.org on the show now for, I don't know, three, four weeks, something like yep. that, um, and, and encouraging our listeners who run social media at large brands around the world to, to you know, consider joining socialmedia.org. Now, you've been actually running the organization in some form or fashion for how long now? 12 years. It hasn't really been 12 years? It, it was originally called the Blog Council. Blog Council. Yes. Social media was not a word yet. <laughs> it was when blogging. Was yeah, that was it. Yeah. Wow. 12 years. And Adam, you were part of the organization back in those early days when you were just a, a child. Just just a child, uh, barely out of- You had to have a permission slip from your parents to That's join right. the blog council. That's right. To go, Especially to go on the field trips uh, with, with Andy. <laughs> yeah, very true. And so all this time, obviously in different iterations, changed the name, uh, socialmedia.org, of course, now uh, covers a lot more ground than just blogging. It's, it's really end-to-end -end social media, both on the proactive marketing side, the reactive- uh, social customer care site, et cetera, it, it has become uh, and has been for a long time really the preeminent place for big time social media managers, social pros, if you will, to interact with their peers, to learn from one another, to uh, have that safe place, if you will, to talk about common issues. My question, and I don't think we've ever actually had this conversation, Andy, is, is did you foresee this being an issue way back then, 12 years ago, that, hey, these, these people are going to have to have a community in which to solve common problems? Or sort of what was the catalyst that made you want to go down this road? Yeah, there's one, it's a good question. Now, there's one big idea that has been around long before we ever did this, which is that some jobs are really hard and some jobs are even harder inside big companies. So the idea that you've got this new phenomena of social media that floats between marketing and PR and customer service and technology, and it might be outsourced and insourced and your CEO cares and your CMO cares and just all these unprecedented problems, rules change every day, tech changes every day, your boss reads you know, a column or here's a podcast and suddenly there's a hot new thing and next thing you know, your well-considered plan goes out the window because your boss's daughter's best friend has declared the new hot trend. And so it's, it's just hard to win. And there's so many resources like the show that's how to be great at social media. And we address a slightly different question, which is how do you run a great program? And that's different. That's a managerial question yeah. more than a social media question. Yeah, more, more of a process uh, and organizational question more so than a creativity and execution issue. Do you feel like um, we are in 2019 living in a resurgent area, era for, for community in general? Like my observation is that, is that people, uh, our peers are gravitating toward Facebook groups and that sort of small group interaction in ways that over the last three, four, five years, they haven't. I almost think about the, the nature of community as, as, as a roller coaster, right? It was everybody's interested in community and then it was more audience and now it's community and then it's audience. It feels like a sine wave or, or maybe I'm just interpreting something that's not there. And do you mean community for social pros or do you mean for our customers? Well, I think it's hand in hand. I think both uh, that, that, that today I've had a number of people that, that, you know, and I know Adam knows people have been guests on the show have said to me either directly or indirectly. The only thing I care about when it comes to Facebook are groups. Now yeah. that's not a thing somebody would have said a handful of years ago. And so that idea that maybe smaller is better, maybe curated is more useful, maybe a cadre of people who are in a similar circumstance, like what socialmedia.org presents, is, is where you really pull um, uh, improvements out, out of the air. Yeah, so com community, is, community is a big word. And sometimes it means like literal, structured community online and off. Sometimes it means trade association. 
it's also used in a more BS way more and more these days, like the conference pass is now called a community membership, but what you get is you go to the conference. So the word's being stretched a little bit, but if you look at community, like bring people together, there's, there's only two of the social platforms really feed that, and that's LinkedIn and Facebook, because posting is what Snap or Instagram are all about, isn't bringing people together, it's more public. Aggregating eyeballs, sure. Right. But if you wanna have a conversation, you know, that fundamental idea, then there's this interesting spectrum. You know, you can go from big tech support community where all your customers are doing Q and A, all the way up to a really small shared professional community. You know, we've got this challenging role and we wanna to work together to figure out how to make that happen. And so that kind of community does ebb and flow because they're easy to start, especially on LinkedIn or Facebook, you can create a, you know, a group um, they start fast, everybody joins, and there's this core group. And then they get broader, and they get, in terms of topic, and in terms of membership, and they tend to get more junior, and then they get all the way down to just we're sort of random hangers on, and then they hollow out. And the original people who had a complex or sophisticated question and relationship, they've moved on, and then everybody else was hoping for the answer, but the people who have the answer were sitting in that centerpiece. So I can talk a lot about community because I do that all day, but the, yeah. the secret sauce is for a community to have longevity, it has to be managed. Like there has to be a real staff, either long-term semi-permanent volunteers or ideally a paid staff. Um, and there have to be membership standards. Because if you don't lock down who the community is for, it always spreads out and dilutes. Well, it, it'll find it'll find its level and the level will always be the lowest common denominator right that's just it just it has to be that way over time yep and that's that sine wave they start yeah. and they hollow out and the next one starts and they hollow out and then in the background there's a handful that just have some some level of permanence and usually it's because there's infrastructure or management behind them Andy, you've hit on a couple of things that Jay and I often talk about on the show. One being that when people come on the show as guests working for one corporation, they inevitably within the next year go find uh, another job. And I think that's something that you see with all of your membership. And I'm curious now having done this for, for 12 years, at least for the, the transition from the blog council to socialmedia.org, we can talk about some of the other councils here in a little bit. I'm curious about the evolution of both the member kind of what they look like, what they know, what they do, what keeps them up at night, and how socialmedia.org has had to evolve as well to provide different services, different support, different community, you know, over this nearly uh, a decade. Yeah, so it's very interesting. Um, some, of the, some of the ideas have stayed exactly the same all this time. You know, if you're running the program, there's these questions of, internal politics and getting buy-in and support and recognition. There's how do I staff it? What do I insource? What do I outsource? And these are conversations that we've been having since 07. Right. So those, are, those have never changed the whole time. And even when the medium changes, your know, social media ra is radically different. There's still this question of, oh crap, what's the next Snapchat? Do I have to do it? Is it gonna matter? If it matters, who do I hire and all that? So that's all just has never changed. Um, teams are evolving. So now you've still got, you know, all, all org charts have a little bit at the top. So those how do I lead questions at the top are the same handful of people. But now instead of managing three people, they're managing 30 or 50. And so it's a very different, kind of experience, so we think focus is important. So socialmedia.org has stayed as the only group for that top little chunk. And there's probably a lack of resources out there for people who are in mainstream social teams, you know, this podcast being one of the few, but there's not a great group you could go join if you're at, on a big social media team that helps you do that. Um, but then what we're also seeing is now social is getting specialized in different industries. So we have a group where it's only social media leaders at hospitals, where every single member runs the social program at a big hospital. And their stuff is 50% exactly the same as social media at a big brand, but 50% radically different. 
because you know someone tweeting pissed off about Mountain Dew and the new flavor is not the same as someone tweeting from the ER if yeah. they need it. And, and, and obviously regulatory considerations as well. Are, are you going to create a, a social media.org adjunct for other industries like financial services, higher ed, et cetera? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. So the hospitals group is doing really well, social media.org health. They're in their third year. Um, we created a group called social media.org talent, which is for the people using social for recruiting. And what's interesting there is their use of social is very different than social media for brand marketing. And a good example of that is how different the metrics are. So like in a recruiting environment, you don't have long-term followers because right. people follow you while they're looking for a job yeah. and then they yep. drop when they get or you get the job or they don't get the job. So you've got to argue, you got to fight for the same resources with totally different metrics. So that group, we formed a separate community for them and they have a different tool set. So it was, it was social media became a smaller percentage of the conversation. So they moved it or we moved the name over to the talent marketing board. It's how are you using digital to promote people wanting to work at your company? which is a wholly different question than social media for brand or social media for hospitals. So I say that not. Oh, yes. I was just going to say, we've had a couple of great episodes on this show uh, on that topic. Carmen from Cisco, Vanessa yes. from Hilton, um, and a number of other leaders who are really terrific at, at using social to, to become employers of choice, generate more resumes in, in tight labor markets, et cetera. Yeah. And then that's, I talk less about all of our, all of our communities because of us, but more to share this idea that a great community needs narrowness. You know, that fewer topics, similar people. So you're having deep, rich conversations about fewer things. One of the things I've always thought is really interesting about socialmedia.org and, and your variety of, of uh, other boards is while these issues are, are about social media, it says it right in the name, that, that in-person events are a huge part of how this works. I know Adam has spoken very highly about uh, the events. I was one of the few people who have ever been allowed uh, from the vendor side as a consultant to attend one of your events. It was an extraordinary experience. I find it interesting that a community that is about social media is so driven by face-to-face -face interactions. Can you talk about that? Because I think some people will find it um, a little bit ironic. It's um, the, um, yeah, I mean, there's this, Community is not Q and A, you know, it's not, uh, we're not trying to, you know, build a document or gather knowledge. You know, that you can get great from Forrester or Gardner or something that information. Your community is building relationships with people. And then really the, the full sentence should not be community, but it's community of support. And you can't share or you won't share deeply. You won't share the hard challenges. You won't talk about, how you really solved thing until you've sat down for a meal and eaten with somebody and you really know you can trust them and they're going to be there for you and you're going to be there for them. And that happens in person. I think one of the things that was interesting to me, Andy, has having been a, a member twice was while the organization kind of pays for the membership to, uh, to socialmedia.org, it's really the individual, the practitioner that's getting a lot of the benefit from it from, you know, from personal growth and, and opportunities. I'm, I'm curious if you've seen any evolution in that as, uh, as companies continue to grow and as social media practitioners continue to move up kind of in the ecosystem. You know, the, the senior social person a decade ago was probably at a manager level. But to your point, now you've got people at, at VP and SVP roles with teams of 50 or 100 people and also dealing with paid social budgets of millions or tens of millions of dollars in the largest organizations. How has that changed the, uh, the charter of socialmedia.org for the personal and professional growth? Or is it kind of, as you said, it's becoming less about for some of those practitioners, the social media tactics and strategies and more about how to become a better effective executive, how to become a better manager of those people who are doing those activities. Yeah, it's um, it's a good question, and, and really, this this theme that we're that we're talking about here is you know this um, how is the job changing, and how do you support people in that changing job is what's really interesting. If you had asked us five years ago, what is the benefit of being part of a leadership community, we would have said, 
great information from people who've got jobs like yours. And the second thing we would have said is confidence and credibility. You can team up with people like you and figure out if you're doing the right thing and a community of support, you know, the emotional support to do the job. And that was a focus that's very much about loneliness. I guess it's a hard, a hard job. Uh, today, it's much more actionable answers. Same idea, like good advice from people who've done this before. But then I would say leadership support is what we talk about next. How do I run this giant program? Because now I'm leading it. I'm not just doing it. And we talk much more about risk avoidance, not in the I'm scared to do something, but in the idea that there are now, as you said, millions of dollars at stake, giant teams, lots of people with their finger on the tweet button and global brands. And so the, the risk profile changes as it gets bigger. So this is a, a different conversation in how you support a leader running this. So it's, um, it's moving up and more complicated. I mean, one of the things that we see a lot is, you know, let's say hypothetically you wake up one day and here's just two fun examples. The one is you wake up one day, your Facebook numbers have crashed. That means one of three things. You screwed up. Your agency or spread faster sprinkler, who's ever in the middle screwed up or Facebook changed the algorithm. And you need an answer to that question within 10 minutes because the CMO is walking down the hall and she's about to pound on your door. And so you know, we provide a conduit where you can say, has anyone seen anything weird with your Facebook numbers? And you need a confidential group where everyone can say, oh yeah, we're all seeing it. And then it's, whew, it's not me, I'm good. And then the other thing that still exists all the way back to the early days is the, the unknown, you know, the unprecedented situation. And those still just keep, you know, hitting us in the face like big fish. You know, just, you know when the, it's been about two years now, but when the president-elect Trump tweeted that Boeing's airplanes were too expensive and they sucked and whatever he said, no president had ever called out a company by name at all. And so now if you're sitting there at Boeing thinking, uh, we're off the map and everybody else at a big brand is thinking uh, we're off the map and I need an answer to how do you respond before the CMO comes down the hall and says, who the hell's running social media and what do I do about this? So it's a different level game at this point. Well, the good news is the president now calls out brands every day. So we've got a, a you know, we've got a, a basis of, uh, of comparison now that uh, everybody can, can draw from. We've done this now a few times. Yeah. yeah. I think a big part of, of, of that and even kind of the example you use for, for Boeing and Boeing being the first certainly made it in an awkward position is around ethics. And certainly 2018 has been a year where social media and ethics have been very much in the mainstream news as we've seen the, the challenges and issues with Facebook and other social media properties. As socialmedia.org in a way is a trade organization, you know, you are being kind of tasked upon and called upon, not just to kind of have that confidential group where people can talk about, oh crap, what, what happened last night? And are you seeing the same thing? But also to kind of represent the industry as a whole. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about how socialmedia.org has had to kind of rise up to, to be able to handle things like that. And also if you could put your uh, thinking cap on and your fortune teller hat on, what do you think 2019 is going to bring as it relates to, to ethics in our space? So that's a big question. So first I'll clarify, we're not a trade association in the sense that we're a community for our members to help each other, but we don't represent them and we don't set policy. So we're not taking any stands on behalf of the industry. And you're not marching on Washington. We are not marching on anything whatsoever. I think that's, that's an interesting side note in terms of if you build a good community, you know, when you add advocacy to the mix, now you limit the number of companies that will be able to join or able to participate and suddenly it's a Washington office question. And so it gets more complicated when you, when you add that element. So for us, it was pure, how do we support the leaders independent of where their companies are? Now with that said, and what Adam's talking about and something that the two of us have been talking about now for hell, 17, 18 years, you know, long yeah. before social media, this idea of word of mouth ethics and then social media ethics and that topic, which I'm a rabid purist on this idea that you can't use these tools to deceive. So if we get into personal life regrets, I mean, we were out there as early as 07 saying 
social media disclosure has to be absolute. And brands are the ones who write all the checks. I mean, social media is funded at some level in the end by the ads that pay for everything. And if brands push the envelope on social disclosure and normalize the idea of hidden messages, we are going to corrupt this medium and it's going to hurt us all. Now, what I could not have predicted five years ago, but came to be is we norm, not only did we normalize lack of disclosure and we used marketing and tried to make it look like social media that morphed into a multi-billion dollar native advertising industry, which is now not advertising looking like social. It became advertising looking like journalism. And then that became normalized and accepted. And that directly led to, in my opinion, the politics problem we have now where fake news and we don't trust the media. Of course, we don't trust the media. We spent $10 billion over 10 years to say anyone can buy a story. And we made that just part of everyday life. So we lost that fight and now everyone's paying that price. And now everybody on Instagram is trying to sell you a teeth whitener. Exactly. One of the things that we talked about, Andy, when I interviewed you for my book, Talk Triggers, is, and I think you are the best in the world at this rant, so I'm going to give you a chance to re-rant here on the Social Pro Show. <laughs> which, which rant will this be? Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> go to your rant Rolodex. Uh, you no, the ethics rant, and now we'll do this no, one. No, this one is the, the, the tendency of many people to believe that social media and word of mouth are the same. That, that, that if you are good at social, that invalidates the need to be good at word of mouth. And, and that is wrong and dangerous and foolhardy in a lot of ways. Uh, but I'd like you to, to talk about it because uh, I've heard myself say it too many times. Cool. And I, love, I love this topic. Um, social media is a tool. You know, it is a, a way to deliver a message. And it's a really powerful tool because it's a way where anybody can deliver a message. Word of mouth is a bigger idea that sits on top of it. Word of mouth is this idea that if you give people a reason to talk about you and you make it easier for that conversation to take place, your fans will support you and rally to you and bring all their friends to do business with you. Or if you're awful, it will help your fans hold you accountable, or your critics hold you accountable for not being good. So word of mouth is a great idea. So as a word of mouth marketer, you've got really clear goals. Who is going to tell their friends about you? And how are you going to make it easier for them to talk? And so, and what are they going to talk about? You know, there's sort of three things and I call them talkers, topics, and tools. And you've got talk triggers and we have versions of the same LTs. That's the most important thing. There's a T. <laughs> uh, so when you get to talkers, topics, and tools, who's going to spread the word? What are they going to talk about? And then how are we going to help them share it? Tools are a distant third. And the tool has to be dictated by who's talking and what they're saying. So if the word of mouth campaign is we're selling something to new moms, the talkers may be daycare teachers. And then the topic is how this makes something easier. And then the tactic might be sampling to daycare centers. And social never comes into it. So if you're starting with social, or I want a viral video, uh, you're starting at the wrong end of the roadmap. Yeah, you, you have to have a story that people want to tell first. And social may be one of the places that story is told. But there's a lot of great word of mouth successes that are barely, if ever, talked about in social. But, but still are really effective at, at, at storytelling and creating customers through customer conversations. It, it's not... Um, you know, what I always say is that is to say that word of mouth and social media are the same is like saying that a toothpaste tube and the toothpaste inside are the same, right? One is a container and one is the ingredient. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. The, the hot story coming out of CES right now, the first one I've seen is this company that has this machine that bakes loaves of bread, you know, live, like it's, it's about the size of two refrigerators and it's a whole bakery popping out fresh loaves of bread and it is... You know, not a social story. They launched it with a trade show booth and a press release, but it's super shareable and super cool. So it's spreading fast. So, you know, an Instagram post isn't the same as walking up to a machine that smells like 
fresh cooked bread and they're handing out samples and arguably the fact that it is so not a phone or digital gadget and they drop right. it in the middle of yeah. a consumer electronics trade show. That, that's exciting. Yeah. Breadbot. That's what it's called. Breadbot. All right. We'll look that Breadbot. up. Make sure we'll, we'll link it up on the show notes at socialpros.com. Breadbot. It's a good name. Yes. But Andy, even to use Breadbot as an example, it is a compelling story. It is shareable and we could dissect that if we, if we wanted to. But to get back to your three T's, that, that T for topic, I think, is shifting and it is evolving. You know, the traditional call to action that we were all comfortable with uh, a, a decade ago isn't quite as effective anymore. And one thing I've really been interested in what you're doing is, is around that social, that social activism side of the story, the topic, and really how you're also approaching uh, your, your organization. That social uh, in your world, Andy, kind of has two meanings. One, there's the social media side of social, but there's also the social activism, the social community, uh, the charitable philanthropic side, and how important that is, both for the charter of your organization, but that's also something that seems to be very much resonating with audiences right now. You can't just talk about your product, and you just can't talk about how it makes a better loaf of bread. You've got to talk about you know, that social aspect. And I'm curious how you bring that into your organization um, and how you bring that into your communities that, that you grow there at socialmedia.org. Yeah, so I mean, it's interesting. Like people, if we, go, if we go back to another big picture mini rant, you know, we, we all saw as, as, as paid search marketing and SEM and pay-per-click and all the stuff sort of grew, uh, it really pushed us to metrics-based advertising because you can throw money in the machine and so much comes out and you can try 80 keywords and 80 taglines and the best one comes out and we're squishing the creativity out of the process. Now that's the other, that's one extreme. And the other extreme is, Hey, what if there was a commercial of a car driving on a mountain and you know, that the other end of the lack of creativity in, in TV advertising because we're still running the commercial of the car driving down the mountain or the truck towing the thing, you know, put a thing in the bed of the pickup truck and see how fast it goes. Uh, so we're in this, this wide swing. And then what's now dropped in the middle of this is we all have good enough stuff. Like it's all just fine. All the phones do the same exact thing. And all of, you know, if you want a product to solve a problem, you will go on Amazon and you'll get it and it will work. And so the quality gap has gone away and everything's sort of good. And so how do you make a story? How do you make people pay attention or connect with you in some way? And that requires some kind of community or meaning or purpose or some higher level feeling that says, this matters to me. And that has to have some level of authenticity behind it. That has to have some kind of something more than I make a thing and you can buy it. And um, I mean, going back, Seth Godin, you know, uh, early, you know, viral marketing talk, you know, being good enough is table stakes. You know, now you have to be remarkable and remarkable means something worth remarking upon. And that's the hard part because you got to be different or special or whatever. So the hot one now are the away suitcases. Everyone's got the same, the Warby Parker of suitcases. And the thing that made it remarkable was a battery charger, a phone charger built into the suitcase. And yeah, it's not that big a deal. Like you could, everyone has a phone charger. Jay gave me one a year ago. So I have a phone charger. I didn't need it bolted to my suitcase, but there was some duct tape. I got some duct tape sticking on the outside. It's, um, so I don't know if that's exactly what you're asking, but this idea that there has to be something more than I'll give you the stuff you paid for. That's not a very exciting message. Yeah, it, it's an emotional uh, need. And that emotional need is cer certainly oftentimes about the product, but it seems that the organization and what that organization or company is doing needs to make me feel better as a consumer. If all products are generally a commodity, if all products are generally the same, I'm as a consumer, I'm going to go with the product that comes from the company that's doing something a little bit different, a little bit special. 
And I think that's a distinction. And I'm curious how social media, in your opinion, kind of fits into all that, telling that story of the behind the scenes of why the executives of this organization are nicer than the executives in another organization. Yeah, it's um, what social does is it lets you rally humans around an idea. Because those ideas that come out of the marketing department are never going to be fundamentally credible, but a crowd of people are. So let's look at the, uh, the, the puffy micro puff winter jackets that everybody has right now. And you can get Patagonia at one end. That's the most expensive, fanciest little puffy jacket. And, you know, Amazon has a generic one for 30 bucks. And then, you know, Uniqlo has their no logo one in the middle. But they all look exactly the same. They do the exact same thing. Um, but if you go at the high end, you got Patagonia North, Patagonia North Face. They're making pretty much the same product, same quality level, both great brands. Um, but Patagonia has got this world of social good you know, deeply embedded in their story, uh, which wouldn't matter if it was a press release. It does matter that it is repeated and amplified and shared and spread through social, through photos, through com consumer stories. And then sort of that consumer belief in the bigger message then loops back to the store, the online store, because you read the reviews, the reviews don't say this was a good jacket. The reviews say, I buy this jacket because of, and then this is the manufacturing thing that uses less resources. And now you're seeing the word of mouth cycle. So social media is part of it, but so are reviews. And so is traditional messaging. And it comes back to, those T's. In this case, the talkers are motivated consumers who have a passion around a certain thing. Then the topic is, we're greener to shorten it. And then the tools are, in some ways, full court press from the company. Everything about their website is about the green, not the products. And then push it through every channel till word of mouth kicks in and it starts getting amplified in every way. Yeah, I think it's it's a, word of we're at this place where the tools are are less effective in some cases, right? Because we've got to rely on paid social instead of organic social in some cases. And so I, I, I feel like we're at this era where where topic is actually taking precedence in a way that it wasn't in the past, that people are saying, look, we've got to take more of a stand because that gives us more amplification. Uh, and I look, at, look, Nike, right? You took a brand that's a very broad brand that, that really hasn't been massively overt about social responsibility or taking a stand really on anything uh, over time. And now they've decided to say, all right, let's, let's put a topic out there that, that, that we can call our own and that will help us sell more stuff. And, and so I think we're going to see a lot more organizations this year and in the years to come saying, okay, look, if we're going to try to be all things to everybody, that doesn't break through anymore. So we have to be something really important to a, a smaller group of people uh, and actually Mark Schaefer's new book is about that. It's called Marketing Rebellion. He'll be on the show uh, in, a, in a three or four weeks, and we'll talk about that more in depth. But I, I think we're really at a watershed moment here where, where people are going to say, look, what, what do we, why do people care about us and, and making good products ain't enough? Yeah, and you know, 10 years ago, we would have had a similar conversation that says, you know, good enough is just table stakes. But now we could take what you said to the farthest extreme, which is, Amazon wins product like they will make or Walmart too. you know, they will make a fine product and they will sell it for the best price and nobody else wins that game. And yeah, I think it was a marketing decision 10 years ago. Now it's an existential decision. Good point. Yep. So, yeah. So if you're going to go put pictures of people all in the same black puffy jacket all through social media and it's just a social media campaign, you could not tell from an Instagram square which jacket is made by who product doesn't get you there. So it has to be who's going to follow me, who believes, why do they believe, you know, why am I special? And is there either a meaningful purpose difference? Is there a meaningful social difference? Is there a meaningful emotional difference or is there a true community? And if you can deliver any of those, you win because someone else can always replicate the product. 
Well, if you're looking for a true community and you are a manager of a social media program at a large brand, you absolutely positively need to be part of socialmedia.org, uh, Andy's fine organization that Adam and I talk to you about here every week on the show. Andy, we're going to ask you the two questions we've asked every single guest here in more than nine years on this program, 350 episodes or whatever the number is. Um, first question, what one tip would you give somebody who's looking to become a social pro? I wasn't, I was totally not prepared. Maybe we'll edit this. Little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's been nine years, I failed that. Um, um, the, no, the, 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 the one tip for someone who is a social pro is it's all about the real people. You know, get them talking about you. Yeah. And, and, and the real people are, are actual customers, right? It's not so much let's get a Kardashian. It's get people yeah. who, who actually have experienced your products and services. Yeah. You can pay and put a whole lot of stuff out there and you can do it. You can do advertising on social media. It's just advertising and it's leaving most of it on the table. Well, and you can create an army of fans, you win. As we've said, advertising is a tax paid by the unremarkable which is the greatest, the greatest Robert Stevens line of all time. Uh, last question for Mr. Andy Cernovitz, CEO of socialmedia.org and board.org, author of the great book, Word of Mouth Marketing. If you could do a video call with any living person, who would it be, my friend? Today, um, Mark Benioff. Hmm. I look at the, you know. Adam, Adam, send a note, right. make, make this make happen. Uh, I didn't know, I didn't even make that connection, but I look at, I look at, um, you know, Salesforce, we've been a customer since 04, but it at some level is boring stuff. It is a database. But then when you look at 170,000 people coming to a user conference, like that, I think Salesforce is as big a deal as Microsoft was to PCs. Like they have created community on a scale that, no B2B business I think has ever done before. And it's real and it's real people coming together because they couldn't imagine running their business any other way. And that is way beyond the product. And that is very much about what they've achieved with the humans. Yeah. It's that other side of social that you just articulated, Andy. Yeah. It's community. All right. Well, we'll make that happen. That, that, that's, that's, a, that's a doable proposition. Uh, that's going to be Adam's to-do list is to uh, get, get Andy on the phone with Mr. Mark Benioff, uh, co-founder uh, of Salesforce. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a super great episode. Thanks so much to Andy and his team for uh, being a benefactor of the Social Pros podcast this year. We really appreciate uh, your partnership, my friend. And as I mentioned, every single episode going back to the very beginning of the show is available at socialpros.com. You can get all the stuff, recordings, transcripts, links, uh, some sort of video of a bread bot, perhaps we'll, we'll work on that. It's, yeah, it's going to be sent to sent vision. It's going to be extraordinary. Uh, Adam and I will be back next week. We've got a bunch of great guests coming up. Mark Schaefer, as I mentioned, Seth Godin's on the show. Uh, right. in, in a Another mission today. Uh, yeah, we got all kinds of stuff happening here on the Social Pros podcast. So on behalf of Adam Brown uh, from Salesforce Marketing Cloud and best friend of Mark Benioff, I am Jay Bear from Convince and Convert. He's Andy Cernovitz from socialmedia.org. Thanks as always for listening to what we hope is your favorite podcast. Tell your friends, this has been Social Pros. Mm -hmm.